Thank you so much. Very happy to be uh, with you. No, we were supposed to be two with uh, Oli Oyanao, but uh, he's uh, just uh, waking up uh, from his uh, hospital bed. He got a uh, shoulder uh, injury a couple of uh, weeks ago, and this morning he was operating, but uh, we have been uh, report recording part of the presentation uh, yesterday. So you will be able to see him. So now I'm uh, Thierry Georgiou, head coach of uh, Finnish Orienting uh, national team. Been uh, two years now in this uh, position, but uh, not long enough to speak uh, Finnish. So it will be uh, in English now. And I will uh, leave most of the presentation to this guy uh, in the middle of the picture, Oli Oyanao. So bronze medalist uh, this summer in long distance, and I think his uh, story is a lot more interesting. So a lot of the time tonight uh, will be about him. And you can see around him three coaches, Ronnie and Salmi on the right, Antiaiu on the left, and myself uh, holding the umbrella. So it's a little bit how I see uh, our role as a leader, like uh, the main uh, focus is of course always the athletes and we can't uh, stop the rain, but sometimes we can help a little bit to guide uh, those runners, but most of the work of course is uh, for themselves. So my presentation is quite short and basically it's uh, setting the table for uh, Oli. So I just wanted to give you a little bit the parameters of uh, the World Championships we had in uh, Switzerland uh, in August. And uh, what I feel is the most important as a leader, like this uh, priority list, because we can't uh, be everywhere all the time, and how we prepared as a team. So World Championships, very nice this year. It's not uh, the last 30 years I was counting. It has been uh, only two World Championships we which were over 1,000 meters. The last uh, one was in 2011 in France. In this, uh, I think uh, there is a lot of skiers and biathletes, so probably uh, some of you know uh, La Fecla, so it was the last time. And this summer we were competing around this uh, famous lake, so it's uh, called uh, Flim uh, Lacks. I guess a lot of skiers uh, know about Davos, but not so much about this uh, place. I guess uh, it was uh, some snowboarding uh, World Cup in uh, Flims earlier on, and it's two hours from uh, Zurich. Last uh, last year, I was talking about this uh, embargoed area, so I won't talk so much about it tonight, but uh, basically it's uh, the organizer have to provide this information for all the teams uh, at least uh, four years uh, before the competition, so it's where it's uh, banned to train, so it gets fair for uh, to compete against the locals, so no one is allowed to enter those forests. And from those embargoed area, we have also the organizer publish uh, some built-in, giving some information, a little bit about the nature of the terrains and where the courses are um, supposed to be held. So we see, like for example, here in this picture, the built-in four and the terrain description of the long distance and they start to mention this uh, altitude and we have this for this summer it was we were competing in forest we have a split uh, world championships sprint mostly in city and forest uh, in um, every second year so we have in world championships forest we have three distances long middle relay and uh, on this world championships the altitude of competition where some more quite different. So this it's again the embargo area, and we can see we get the information from the organizer where will be the finish. So it's uh, this, uh, for example, it's the finish area of this um, World Championship. So it means all the competition will end up this uh, place, but we don't know where the courses are starting until uh, the D day. But still, with the terrain description, we get quite a good idea of what kind of uh, terrains and area to prepare for. So with the altitude and the description of the terrain, we knew like the long distance will be in this part of the terrain. The middle distance in a very demanding uh, technically part of the terrain and the long distance little bit mixing those uh, two areas. 
So for the runners, it's a very challenging uh, puzzle because the best are competing in those uh, three distances. And this it's uh, some pieces of the maps. And technically, it's a different challenge, but also physically, it's uh, quite different. So it's quite hard to, to collect all those uh, puzzles and to be uh, very good on those, all those distances. But it's the aim of uh, uh, most of runners the best. So this is a competition week, World Championships in Switzerland. We start with the middle distance qualification. The next day, it's a long distance rest day middle distance final relay so it's almost uh, it's uh, four competition in five days and it's what i wanted to mention a little bit because uh, it's some parameters we need to have in mind when we plan high altitude camp and the preparation basically the last important competition which is uh, part of the qualification process as well the world cup in norway end of April, so all the runners are also taking part to this competition. It was in most uh, this year. World Championships test races in Switzerland about one month before. And in between, in blue, I wanted to mention it because I had mentioned it uh, last year. It was a lot more um, of a problem because it was uh, one week before World Championships. It's those big uh, club uh, relay, two million Sweden, uh, Venla and Yukola in uh, Finland and of course it has to be uh, part of our uh, program because like uh, the Finnish club are helping us uh, a lot I will say like 50% uh, of the budget of the athletes in average are coming from the club so it means like uh, and you will see it in um, all this preparation our preparation is full of compromise and it's always about finding the best compromise and for this, building up what I'm calling the priority list is very important because I would say um, the owners tend to forget uh, the big picture and uh, for us it's a big responsibility to bring them back always to, um, to this big picture because uh, I think top elite uh, athletes, they are very much on details. Uh, of course, uh, we don't have a vaccine or shoes uh, in orienting so much about this, but uh, you can uh, quickly lose uh, the focus on what makes the difference at the end. And I have said a little bit this diagram, of course, it's uh, simplified. There are a lot of uh, more stuff, but this is what I call the priority list. Technically, it's still where people are bleeding uh, most time uh, in competition. We see we do a lot of uh, GPS analyze afterwards. Those are clips from actually the world championships races so we see like when they are like plus uh, and a small number it's when people are losing time so i think this one was quite spectacular mistake it was the one of uh, tove alexanderson the swedish runners where basically she lose uh, the long distance on this one so we can see on just this small fraction of uh, the race she's losing uh, on her main competitor uh, about one minute uh, 30. And uh, we see in this side some clips of the middle distance. Some are our runners, so I didn't want to name them. But for example, the first control of the middle distance, some people are starting with uh, plus one minute 30, just technically. So it means like even if uh, you have a physical boost from high altitude, it will be very hard to catch uh, this kind of mistake by uh, running. But of course, the physical part, is highly important, especially in uh, terrains which are uh, not very much your uh, cup of tea. We don't have this kind of steepness so much in uh, Finland, so it's always a challenge to prepare and why we need so many camps abroad. We see on those two slides, it's the end of the middle descent, so very much uh, the last uh, minute of the race. A very steep uphill. Uh, very few people able to to even run on this part. It's the end of the race. It's uh, plus uh, 35 degrees. And we can see those are two runners in top six. So even in top six, in just uh, one minute running, some people will uh, lose 30 seconds. Same in quite a runnable part of the middle distance. And in Donhill, I wanted to mention this. So this part is uh, going down this way. Two top runners. And we can see the running skills 
to be able to speed up in downhills and uh, so it makes a quite big difference and this it's a uh, thin compared to Tove Alexanderson so we see the running ability is uh, quite important and then it's a little bit I won't get into details but uh, everything is so much together it's what I call uh, joy I think in competition it's so important to see it as a game if you want to perform or at least it's what I have experienced during my career and seen as a coach this help a lot, both the technique and uh, the mental part. So everything is connected and fit fitness. I mean, we can talk about high altitude if uh, the runners are not in their competition weight or have not understand what is uh, competition nutrition. It doesn't help so much to spend time in uh, high altitude. So I would say at this World Championships, the, al the altitude preparation, was really the top of uh, the iceberg. But as always, it's connecting the technique because if you feel uh, better, of course, you will orient her better and it also affecting uh, the physical mood. And um, it's a little bit how we see it and how you will see it in uh, all his pre uh, preparation. How we prepared as a team, I would go quite quick on this part because Oli is also covering this camps. The main focus was uh, to be prepared for steep hills uh, running, both uh, uphill and downhill. I think downhill were uh, as much uh, important as um, uphill this time. And also we tried to create the technical and physical challenge in all our camps. A big challenge was, of course, uh, the terrains get uh, quite much of snow. So we are not a uh, winter sport, so we want snow-free terrain. So it's not that easy to get uh, in high altitude um, without snow uh, all year round. And we don't have the biggest budget. So, of course, uh, we always consider the number of days and how we use our budget. So we see our preparation, World Championships, middle of July. And uh, we get back, basically, we start the preparation in November with the info camp, but I was just putting uh, 2003 in the picture. The first important part, what I'm calling the basement camp. This year it was in Tenerife. So this part was uh, part of the federation and uh, most of the runners, like 90%, uh, were staying on their own camp. Some people were staying quite high. In Tenerife, you can stay... Uh, uh, along this uh, volcano at 2,000 meters, but the most important was to find some hills. So this uh, it's probably the best place uh, in winter to get some hills. We were even asking some Finnish map makers to map some uh, volcano so we can really uh, uh, simulate the steepness of Switzerland. We had maps where we were competing at uh, our training competition like at uh, 1,600 meters. So this was very relevant to have those trainings. So very successful uh, camp, something we will do again for sure in the future. And then some activities for the club, always let, letting some space. And then in March again, we went to Italy with a double focus. Uh, next week we are at European Champs uh, in Italy. So it's a, a sprint, but we try to keep uh, the sprinters and uh, the forest runners as much as possible to get some kind of uh, team spirit. We had this pre-season camp in Italy where the focus was again on hills. So the, for the first time we were able to reach some terrains. Uh, so this is just north of uh, Lake Garda. So some of the trainings were um, above 1000 meters. So it was starting to be more and more relevant and also a lot of uh, steepness. And then finally, we see we had the walk test race, but we were like uh, helping a little bit the runners to get good preparation. A lot of them in uh, St. Moritz. But to our walk pre-camp, so really like after Yukola, we were staying on spot from basically Yukola. We really were trying to be as close as possible from the competition. So really simulating the same kind of courses, steep, uh, steepness. So those were three days where we were simulating a long distance, a relay, a middle distance final with as much parameter as possible, as close from uh, world championships. And I like this quote uh, quite well. 
Oli Oyanao was uh, doing extremely well in those training, and I think it's where he partly boosts uh, his self-confidence. So it's something I believe uh, very much. What happened uh, during work? I think it's best if it's me who talk about it. I don't think uh, Oli will have uh, say this of uh, himself. Third place at the long distance. First individual mal, uh, medal since 10 years. I think the Finns were uh, super successful in 2000 uh, years. But for some years, we have been a little bit struggling. And now it feels uh, very good because I will uh, say it was not the best terrain for, for a Finn. So it means uh, it's a big reward for his preparation. And I think we have a lot as a team to learn from this. We can see the start of the long distance for him. So I think you get a very good picture of what was... Uh... That one is going to be similar whether you're going 17 or 21. Here's Oli Oyanaho, who really, I think, in the last year, year and a bit, has had kind of a senior breakthrough in terms of his forest career. Of course, multi-Jaywalk champion, junior world champion. He's had uh, lots and lots of success as a junior. Managed to make a transition, I think, a little bit earlier on in terms of the sprinting, but he's really, I think, managed to break through into the, the senior career. It's, it's, it's always interesting how some juniors are able to do that so easily, like Casper Fossa. I mean, he just was straight into his senior career I, easily, and it, it took Oli and her a little bit more time. I think often it depends on how much training you put into your junior career. Like, if, you, if you're up in many running hours already as a junior, then it's, of course, harder to build up, up when you change to the, to the elite. So we see very much the type of terrain, at least uh, at the start. So they were basically starting from the very top. The start of the race was uh, in this slope. Uh, almost 2,000 meters from um, above uh, sea level. And the finish was done uh, in the valley. So we can see probably you, you understand uh, this part a little bit better for those who are not orienters. So it's a map with uh, different altitudes. So what we can see... It's like it was a course with uh, very much downhills to be orienting. Still, the course was uh, having uh, 700 uh, meters climbing. So it was uh, not only downhills, but the start was on top and staying for half of the race above 1,400 meters. And then only the second half was a bit lower in uh, altitude. So now... I think the best is to leave the floor to Oli. So it's this guy in the middle of picture. This uh, was the World Cup in Davos uh, one year ago. We were visiting some top and um, now I will play this small video. Okay, hi everyone. It's uh, Sunday evening. I'm uh, unfortunately won't be able to make it tomorrow. I'll have a shoulder, shoulder surgery and didn't have that many options to choose from. So that's a shame, but uh, I would have been doing this online anyway. So <laughs> I guess it doesn't make any big difference. The only thing is that you can't ask that many questions, but um, I tried to ask my followers on Instagram at least for if they had some questions and I uh, got quite a few questions from them. So those ones I have tried to kind of uh, answer uh, in my presentation um, some of them maybe more indirectly but anyway um, and then I guess Thierry already uh, presented uh, the race I was preparing for uh, all the parameters and uh, stuff like that so uh, this my part will be more about my individual uh, preparations uh, because with the national team we, we had a more focus on the technical preparation and that's how it should be as well I think because we have a limited budget and not everyone was training for the for the long distance as well so there's only a few people that were doing some high altitude preparations and I don't know what Thierry said if this will be about my individual preparations but he has also helped me a lot uh, with this camp spot with the planning and then fixing all the all the training maps the contacts contacts with, with the local people especially in france uh, planning some training courses or <laughs> quite a, many training courses uh, so of course i'm very thankful for that help
Um, and I thought I would be talking a bit like this. So first, a bit like philosophy behind this altitude preparation, um, and then about how I planned this this whole thing, and then some like more details about the training camps, uh, training there, what kind of training I did, and so on. And then in the end, I will show you. Um, okay the past year in a kind of calendar view. So it'll be like first talking about the basics and then getting into more details and then in the end showing kind of the big picture again. So, and then some uh, some final thoughts. Okay, any questions so far? Or shall we move on? <laughs> Maybe we'll move on with the recording. So <clears throat> this one. Uh, I got uh, on Instagram from uh, yeah quite a few times the same type of question. So how many days I spent at altitude during the last year and why? So it was uh, 106 days if you count on like consequent days uh, above 1800 meters of altitude, and the reasons were simply the fact that I was preparing for the walk long distance, uh, which took place at not super high altitude, but anyway, quite high altitude. Um, and the liter literature is uh, quite evident that uh, when you're preparing for competing at altitude, it, it helps that you're uh, acclimatized uh, for that race. Uh, and also like, yeah, after all, the maybe one third of the race was uh, uh, higher than 1,700 meters, something like that. But it could have been even more, maybe half of the race at least, uh, because we were having this butterfly forking in the in the lower part of the of the big slope, and then quite a long like final loop after the road crossing. So I was. Or I wanted to prepare for like even more uh, running time at high altitude. Although I knew it could be like this, that only one third of the race um, will be at, at about 1700 meters. But uh, I wanted to be prepared for, for everything. So, And then, um, this is my own comment, but I think uh, Juha Peltonen and quite many people are recommending this as well so uh, I wanted to practice this several times before doing it uh, before my main races of the season uh, so that's that was maybe the biggest reason why I was doing several training camps during the, the past year but also <coughs> altitude training may uh, enhance performance at sea level as well. So it's not only for uh, competing at altitude, but also maybe otherwise like generally beneficial. Uh, this this one is not so evident in the literature, but but anyway, if you if you manage to find your own way of doing it, then do it right. You may like increase your chance of succeeding. There there is some like inter and intra individual variability but if you if you're doing um, everything right and then just uh, try it several times and learn something from each time you may you may find your uh, own optimal way of doing it and can gain some some small benefit in the at least in the long run But as, as Thierry already said, orienteering is a sport of trade-offs. So there are many things we need to be good at. It's the physical performance is, is only one part. Then we uh, have the technical perf performance and uh, all the mental mental part as well. And, and when it comes to uh, choice of location, for example, for training camps, there are quite many <laughs> things to take into account. Uh, one if, of course, the, the physical training conditions, then the technical, like the conditions for technical training, 
Uh, so that means uh, if there are orienteering maps available nearby and how many of them and what's the quality, what's the type of terrain, is it relevant uh, for the main races of the season, uh, what's the quality of mapping and how much is the driving time, those terrains and so on. Uh, and then, of course, all the like more general facilities or alternative trainings and strength trainings and things like that. And of course, yeah, basically everything like traveling during the camp to the tra- orienteering trainings uh, before and after. So I just want to make sure that um, that the potential benefit actually outweighs the the cost. And with cost, I mean uh, the difference between the ideal training environment uh, with all the things that I just mentioned including traveling during the camp and to the camp and back home from the camp. Uh, so I kind of want to ask myself, uh, if it wasn't for uh, altitude training, where would I be training now at this time of the year? And then kind of try to define uh, what what is that like ideal environment? Uh, how much orienteering do I want to do? So uh, if I need... Uh, many training maps nearby and what kind of terrain and then yeah if I need downhills and uphills for or and and some flatter terrains and of course like better and all that also influences the choice and of course the and 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 then then I compared uh, that like ideal environment to to those uh, altitude training locations that I'm considering. Uh, and of course, the environment can be at best as good as the ideal, then it's the, it's, it, it, then it's a very good place to go for an altitude camp. And of course, I'm, I'm not calculating anything, but I just wanted to show like this type of thinking because, you know, if you're like trying to perfect every small small detail while missing the big picture it would be like i don't know it would be like trying to fix the deck chairs or tables on the titanic and i mean for sure it may look neat and very nice but if you're heading for an iceberg it doesn't really help that much so i uh, kind of want to make sure that i'm uh, uh, focusing on the on the ship that it's sailing in the right direction and safe direction, and only then focus on the smaller smaller de- details like how should I arrange the <laughs> deck chairs or what kind of candle I would like to have on the tables or the font for a menu list. Um, but so practically speaking, I just uh, want to keep the cost down because the potential benefit is is very low. Uh, so the closer uh, the zero of the better. So like practically speaking, this is what I want to look for that, uh, that the training environment uh, in the altitude training location would be as close to the ideal one as possible. Because then it's uh, even though the benefit potential benefit is small, it's anyway a good place to, to go to because the environment is otherwise very good as well. Um, and then one third thing uh, was to use the help of professionals. So here uh, I would like to thank, uh, say thank you for Juha and his team at Hula for uh, cooperation. That was very good. Uh, and also I've been using the hypoxic, hypoxic <laughs> rooms at Urohe, our academy here in Helsinki. Uh, so it's been uh, great to have these uh, kind of facilities and, and professionals here, here in my hometown. And I'm very thankful for that help. Uh, and together with Juha, we were planning this, uh, this altitude preparation last year in the summer. Uh, and we wanted to do like this. So first, a longer camp, 
uh, at altitude, like a traditional altitude camp, and then uh, doing some intermittent uh, hypoxic exposure and training uh, for four weeks more. Uh, and why longer camps? Because it's quite evident in the literature and that uh, they correlate with higher increase in hemoglobin mass. That was the reason. And, and then for this intermittent hypoxic exposure and training, uh, it has the potential to to prolong the positive changes in blood values after returning to sea level, or, or there's no like I don't actually know if you has been doing some research about this. I don't know if it's public yet. I tried to find it in Google Scholar, but didn't find it. So maybe it's not public yet. But anyway, there's like not uh, that much quantitative research about this. Uh, so it's more like a bit still a bit speculative. But uh, if it works, it may of course, help to uh, support the following training period uh, and also like prolong the acclimatization for competitions uh, at altitude. So for example, uh, for the walk long distance, and this is quite good because usually after a high altitude camp, when you're returning to sea level and you're acclimatizing uh, back to sea level, uh, there are some quite big changes in your uh, performance level during the first two weeks. Uh, so of course, if you could like keep the potential blood value benefits and all the other benefits, but lower the risk of having this kind of bad days after returning from uh, high altitude, it would be really good. Um, but as I said, it's more like we are still waiting for that scientific results of this uh, but for me it was I, I i wanted to try this and because i was having the, the opportunity to do this uh, here in helsinki in the hypoxic rooms of urohea uh, so it didn't like cost me anything to try it the cost was zero and also during the winter uh, I would have been anyway training around uh, Konob uh, in France. There I was also, uh, and I would have been uh, doing like some long runs and a bit of cross country skiing up in the mountains anyway. So it was, uh, there was no cost for me trying this thing. Uh, and then first about the classical or like the traditional part like the longer training camp. So they were three to four weeks long. And there I always took the first approximately five days quite easy and also the last last couple of days easy before uh, before traveling to try to yeah stay on the safe side with the overall training load. Um, then my training was during this longer camp was mostly easy and moderate. Uh, only one to two faster trainings uh, per week. Um, but then in orienteering, it's very important to run at competition speed. Uh, but I was uh, like for the technical preparation, but I was able to combine this pretty well by doing a lot of like downhill intervals where I was running um, moderate or threshold base uh, up and then I could run the competition speed like downhill uh, downhill to flat intervals so I've, I was doing quite many of these type of trainings and I, I think it was good for a for a walk long distance as Terry showed there was maybe almost two kilometers of downhill in total so that was good and then yeah, some of the faster sessions I I run on low altitude, but it was mostly if the if the best training maps uh, were uh, uh, situated a, a bit lower uh, on some camps, that was the case. So it, I, I when I wanted to prepare for this world champs, I I did most of the like moderate and threshold sessions uh, on high or moderate altitude to kind of yeah simulate the 
uh, competition altitude. So only for for the main reason for going down was mostly just to get to run on snow-free surface during the winter or then if I had some important orienteering session to do. Um, and then I uh, tried to be a bit extra careful with the training load and especially the training intensity. Uh, so it was mostly this easy and moderate trainings. Um, and then um, I was having like control trainings one to four times a week, uh, depending on the camp. Uh, because when I was doing more orienteering, it's, uh, I wanted to prioritize that. So then I maybe had one like control training a week on, on flat and fast surface where I could uh, see how, how the body was working like uh, Yes, maybe like five times five minutes or something like that. And then I could check the kilometer speed and measure the lactate and so on. And during some weeks of winter training, when I was doing less orienteering, it was up to maybe four, four times a week that I had a session where I could, uh, yeah, like check how, how, how well recovered I was on. Uh, either some uh, intervals on on flat surface or, or of different length, or then, for example, up uphill intervals on on treadmill. And then another another uh, thing I that I used to follow my and track my recovery uh, was the polar watch. So just the sleep and recovery from there, and then also my own feeling, um, and my kind of. Yeah, philosophy was to not stress too much if one of these three things isn't super at the moment, if the two other ones still were good. So actually, I never had a situation where all these were bad. Uh, sometimes the feeling was a bit worse, but if the polar feedback and the control trainings went well, then I just uh, went on. And also, if I had a bit first day on some control training I but uh, but if the polar feedback and my own feeling were good at the same time I just uh, yeah executed that training as planned or running a bit slower but making sure that um, I'm not pushing too much and then waiting for the next control training and then it was usually better again so uh, so like this and then uh, quite a lot of focus on nutrition, uh, especially I yeah, tried to eat, eat some more carbohydrates, uh, focus on hydration as well. And then I took some yeah, iron supplements before, during and after after these camps, as recommended by by all the all the Finnish like uh, Hula and Kihu and everyone in Finland, so kind of the traditional Finnish model of doing this, these uh, training camps. And then uh, about this intermittent hypoxic exposure and training, uh, here in the picture, I'm in the altitude training room of Uraha, watching some, I guess it's uh, Jan Koval from a French runner watching a vlog there and running on treadmill uphill. Uh, so I was doing like this. It was uh, either two hours uh, in rest and then one hour uh, easy training. Or uh, when I was doing this in, in like real altitude in, uh, in France and Switzerland, it was sometimes like a longer easy training of three hours, either cross country skiing uh, or running. Uh, and I did this every three days uh, as recommended by, by Juha. So, and, and the first one on the third day after altitude camp. And then every from there, from then on every, every three days. And the altitude was same as during the camp. So nothing, uh, Nothing really extreme, quite uh, moderate, uh, moderate altitude, I would say. 
uh, and the timing with the other trainings was that I did this on easy days or in the evening after a faster session. Uh, so never, or I never did, or Juha didn't recommend me to do any fast session like after, like in the same day uh, after this. So it was either uh, the only training of the day or the second easy training or the easy training after a faster session. And for me, I felt it felt okay to do uh, faster sessions uh, both the next day and then the following day. So that was good. Uh, so basically, I, I could do a fast lesson whenever I wanted to and then just make sure that I do this as the second training of that day or in the easy day. So yeah, that was also one good thing that uh, made the cost of doing this and trying this lower. So I didn't feel that it affected my training like negatively in any way. Uh, and yeah, still a bit extra focus on, on the same things as during the camps. Maybe a bit less, but yeah, anyway, still. And then this is the summary of the of my uh, previous year. It looks a bit messy, although <laughs> it only includes the most important races. So the European champs, uh, 22 in Estonia, the World Cup races, um, and then the World Champs uh, this year, and then all the high altitude related activities. So all the smaller competitions even though some of them were quite important, like the big relay, club relays, Team Milan, Yukola, they are not included here, nor the national team camps that were very important. But uh, yeah, here I wanted to just show the altitude related activities in relation to the most impor important races. Um, so the kind of the first puzzle piece for me was to, was actually to decide that uh, I would be having this last camp in Arosa uh, because I think it was uh, more relevant for uh, when it comes to the technical preparation, more relevant terrains, and also a bit shorter drive to this Flims Locks where the world champs were held uh, and where all the middle distance train and relay training terrains uh, were situated. So that was kind of, yeah, actually my first decision and then after that I decided that uh, I will have my first camp in St. Moritz uh, in August. I went there quite soon after European champs, uh, just uh, four days of rest at home and then a bit more than three weeks there coming back for uh, Finnish champs uh, in, in the first weekend of, of September. Uh, so it was at 800 meters, quite a lot of orienteering. I was visiting, yeah, I guess, all the training maps in the Engedin Valley. Um, and then a couple of ones also in, in Ditsino. So those ones were like quite relevant, but still a bit less relevant than those in Arosa. So I, I, I like my philosophy in the technical training was to was to start with uh, a bit less relevant terrains and then move into more and more re relevant and specific terrains uh, towards the uh, world champs. Um, and then, yeah, actually one, uh, one more reason for the, why I was having this kind of long, long train camps in addition to the fact that they are uh, better for the hemoglobin mass increase uh, was that I like just generally uh, enjoy having these longer camps like for the physical preparation. I, I feel it's uh, nice to have a bit longer camps so there's uh, more space between the traveling days. So it's uh, easier to just kind of train like home. Uh, and also when it comes to technical training, uh, I think it's it suits me better to do the same amount of orienteering sessions over a longer period uh, of time. So instead of having a two-week camp very intense, I I 
I think I I can have a better quality in my orienteering sessions if I do the, those sessions in twenty two two days uh, instead. So the long long camps are kind of like a win 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 situation for me. Maybe not for my bank account, but I will try not to listen to it too much. And then <clears throat> after Saint Moritz, I was supposed to do this intermediate. Uh, hypoxic tr experiment training until the next camp in which was in Kita, Austria. Uh, but I got a bit ill there after a second Finnish champs weekend. Um, so there was a small break of approximately a week. But then I get to go for this next camp, uh, which was a pre-camp for the World Cup final uh, in Davos, Switzerland. Uh, so the races were held at I guess approximately 16 to, or the first uh, uh, competition, the relay was held at between 2000 and 2200, I guess. But then the kind of the main races, uh, the two individual races, middle distance and long distance, were held between 15 and, yeah, let's say 1800 meters uh, of altitude. Um, so it was. Uh, Actually, the ideal altitude for the pre-camp could have been a bit lower. Uh, but as I and Thierry also mentioned, uh, orienteering is a sport of trade-off. So uh, the technical uh, trainings that uh, we could do in, in, in Austria were so good that we and there we didn't find any good place to stay there a bit lower. So, um, so I decided that 2000 meters is yeah, it's a bit higher than I would like it to be, but all the other stuff was perfect, like the terrains for the uh, technical trainings, um, which were quite relevant for a uh, walk middle distance, actually, some of them. And then also for the World Cup in Davos, they were super good. So I think it was a good choice to go there. And also the results in Davos were good. I was uh, fourth in both middle and long distance, so really good. And then we stayed uh, in Davos for some, uh, for a few more days training for the World Champs. Um, and then I was having my uh, season break before starting new season uh, in the French Pyrenees. Uh, that was a very good period of, of three weeks. Then coming straight back to back to a national team uh, kickoff camp in Pajolahti. So it could have been a bit longer, but I wanted to have a, uh, a season break as well. And then I managed to stay three weeks exactly in, in Forum. So that's great, doing a lot of orienteering, some super cool sessions. Um, I was very lucky with the weather as well. And after that, I was having a quite long period of this intermediate hypoxic exposure and training. The first one I did in, in Pajulahti on the national team camp. So it was the 19th. And then after that, I did it in here in Helsinki in, at Uraha. And I was uh, yeah, in really good shape after, after the camp. Uh, I was doing better in the treadmill test than after the World Cup and before the European Champs. Uh, so it was really good. But then I got a bit ill again. Oh no, not ill, but uh, got a small injury uh, in early December. So that was affecting my physical preparation. That wasn't optimal in, in December, but otherwise this period was very good. And I was part of the part of the research uh, group uh, that that the paper is not public yet. I think it's the one of of Juha uh, and some probably some other other uh, researchers as well. But anyway, uh, we were doing the blood measurements uh, of hemoglobin mass and uh, and both like both after the, or before and after the St. Moritz camp and Forum camp. And, and both times the results indicated that this was actually working for me. 
so I was uh, having this higher higher blood values still after after four weeks after returning uh, from high altitude uh, because usually they are the hemoglobin mass starts to go down after approximately two weeks after returning from altitude uh, so that was good and also I didn't like think uh, it affected my like physical training negatively in any way and I was doing, uh, able to do it here at home in Urha so uh, it was very good so then I decided to do do that uh, during the winter as well this time in real altitude so first uh, after the national team camp on Tenerife uh, we went to Forme again this time we were staying at the sports institute so it's uh, a bit higher and the building is uh, quite high so that's why I've ridden 1900 meters for this camp and uh, it was four weeks um, yeah doing quite a lot of cross-country skiing still after the after the <laughs> small injury I had but anyway I could also run almost twice a day um, and then after that I was doing this stuff in in the mountains around uh, Kronov, but got a bit ill again in the early March. So then I, the plan was to do that a bit longer. And then in the spring, I was focusing most on the World Cup um, in uh, in Norway uh, and Tiu Mila, uh, which was in Skellefteå, Sweden, just before the final altitude camp in Arosa. So I went straight from uh, uh, from Skellefteå to Arosa for almost four weeks, then coming back to to run Jukola on the the Friday before the race. I was racing on early on the Sunday morning, and then straight back to Flimslags. And also this time, uh, yeah, staying in the approximately thousand meters at the World Champs Village, and then doing this uh, trainings and. Uh, every three days at at eighteen hundred meters to two thousand meters. Um, yeah, so I think uh, in summary, uh, I would like to maybe emphasize two two things. Uh, the first one is that uh, is the like the cost <laughs> cost benefit ratio. <laughs> I think uh, although it's very very simple but i think it's good to start the planning with uh, this kind of no-brainers and uh, that, uh, that the potential benefit must actually outweigh the the cost of doing that uh, so it's good to start the planning with this kind of no-brainers they're like the like the corner pieces of a puzzle if you think they provide a good good starting point and it's easier to fill in the rest of the puzzle afterwards but then another thing that's also very simple but but quite important is that it's important to have a, a good pl- balance between being planful and and flexible or adaptive because uh, because stuff happens <laughs> as fred smith uh, the founder of federal express put in in an interview with the uh, I guess I don't have the reference here, but it was for the Magasan Fortune uh, back in 2004, November the 15th was the date, I guess. Uh, so it's important to to acknowledge this uh, friction, which is a term this guy Karl von Clausewitz used to de- describe all these kind of uh, unexpected uh, events and obstacles that may arise at any time. So I like this quote a lot because it's, it highlights the, one of the many things that uh, we as an elite athletes and uh, then the big uh, companies and the uh, leaders of, of those companies have in, in, in common. So of course it's uh, about different things for us. The friction is like we may get ill or injured at any time. Uh, also it's uh, like uh, impossible to or, or the body reacts to training a bit differently every time. Uh, so I had this uh, one mention about the about the interpersonal variability in the hemoglobin mass response to altitude training camps, which was uh, 
research group, Finnish research group, uh, their uh, paper published in 2020, so quite new. Uh, so it's uh, like different every time, even if you try to do your do your best and and uh, are doing everything in the same way, the response is from from your body is a bit different every time. So uh, of course it's super important to have a, a good plan, but also uh, also the plan usually never uh, realizes exactly as intended. Uh, so it's important to stay stay flexible and adaptive as well. And then finally, I have uh, two more questions that I got on Instagram that were really good uh, and relevant for this topic, but I didn't quite manage to fit them in the previous slides. So the first one was if there's going to be any changes in my preparation for for the European Champs next year or the other hand, uh, world, home World Champs in Finland 25 when it comes to altitude training. Um, so I would like to divide my answer in, in two parts. First one is the winter training. So if we look at this, this uh, corner piece of my altitude puzzle again uh, and compare the different parts, uh, I would say that the cost of doing that during winter training is approximately the same because anyway, there's uh, going to be snow in Finland. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't be training here anyway. So the ideal environment is somewhere in in uh, in Southern Europe for me, where I can also do altitude training. So it's the same as uh, this year. Uh, and also the benefit is maybe slightly smaller because I don't Maybe if, if I'm not doing any altitude camp before uh, homework, I won't have to kind of practice it before, like doing the altitude preparation, but still the still the overall like benefits uh, of altitude training uh, are there. So it's approximately the same. So the situation is uh, approximately the same also in, in, uh, in two years. So. I would say it's uh, still a very attractive option that I will probably do it uh, in my winter training. But when it comes for uh, for the final preparations, there uh, will be some changes in this ratio because the cost of doing that will increase uh, compared to this year. Because in in around Kuopio, there are not this. Uh, we don't have any hypoxic rooms or or mountains where I could stay. So uh, it would mean at least some traveling to and from the orienteering trainings. And also if uh, like the like the surface uh, of the physical training. So in, in the forest, it's not super relevant. Maybe if I went to, to Pajulahti of Wokati, I could do some like quite specific physical training. Uh, for uh, for Kuopio, but anyway, um, maybe for the technical trainings, it, they are the best ones uh, will be done around Kuopio. So I would say that the cost uh, for doing some final preparation at altitude will be higher, and at the same time, the benefit will be less because the races are uh, at sea level and there's not so much, or the or the literature and research is more questionable whether uh, it really helps to do some final preparations at altitude before sea level competitions. Sometimes it helps, sometimes not. Uh, so overall, I would say that uh, that the uh, situation changes quite a lot. I was considering putting this approximately uh, equal to symbol there, but yeah, I would say it, it will be like the cost and benefit will be approximately uh, equal, or there there is a chance that the cost will be will be higher than the potential benefit. So I'm kind of yeah expecting a break even scenario approximately. So of course I I won't decide it now, but uh, I could at least say that 
it's way less attractive compared to this this year. And how I will decide this is I'll kind of yeah try to define not now but maybe next year uh, I will have quite a good idea of of how much uh, orienteering I would like to do uh, in Kuopia in the summer of 25 and which terrain, training terrains I still want to visit and ATC. And, and, and then I would uh, or will check the altitude training options uh, and kind of compare the two uh, environments and like try to see how much I would lose in terms of other parts of my preparation and an extra traveling if I went to some high altitude place. And of course, if I if I somehow find a solution that uh, that these two or this altitude environment would be close to equal to the ideal uh, environment, I could uh, go for it. But uh, I would say it's less likely than than this year. And then the last one was. Uh, what did I do in another, another way to take the last step I have taken? Uh, short and sharp answer is that there's no big secret. It was more about the aggregation of marginal gains uh, where this altitude training and preparation was, was one puzzle piece. Okay, I think, yeah, that's about it. I think it's... Uh, it's been about an hour now, isn't it? <laughs> I was there is uh, also in this meeting recording. I don't know if he's been listening to me at least, but if I actually used one hour, uh, you won't have so much time tomorrow. <laughs> or then you can get off some, something from my my presentation. <laughs> the, the, you can get off the, the most boring 20 minutes. <laughs> or, or <laughs> It was excellent. Thank you so much. And yeah. uh, best wishes for tomorrow, or at least when it will be uh, live, you will be already done with your shoulder and uh, yeah. it's an easy one. So yeah, uh, Th yeah. thanks for uh, will continue. Yeah, thanks for the uh, invitation for Kihu or wh whoever or whichever organization it was who invited us. And thanks for listening. And yeah, enjoy the autumn, everyone. And I hope you had a very nice and fruitful uh, day with uh, different presentations. All right.